All right, let's start looking at chapter 13, the kinetics of a particle. We looked at kinematics in chapter 12, where we may have been given accelerations and we had to figure out where the particle was or how fast it was going, but we were not given the thing causing the acceleration. So um, I went over Newton's laws with you, but let's go ahead and start off by looking at Newton's second law. You might see it as NSL sometimes. Um, I'm going to read this straight from the book actually first. Um, what it says is that if we apply an unbalanced force F, some vector F to a particle, and then measure the acceleration A, we can get the ratio of proportionality M. M is proportional to F over A. Well, we normally see this as force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, it's okay. This is how we will typically use it. Um, but what we're looking at is this, this mass is a constant during acceleration for most of our problems, and it provides a quantitative measure of the resistance of the particle to a change in its velocity. So we're talking about inertia here when we look at it in that form. Okay. Um, forces are vectors. Acceleration is a vector also. Uh, mass is a scalar quantity. And we can break this up into components and in different coordinate systems, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, one of the first forces that was discovered was Newton and the law of gravitational attraction. Okay, um, what this said was that we could relate the force due to gravity between two objects, M1 and M2, by looking at the inverse square law. And this is kind of common, the 1 over r squared thing. And then they just had to multiply it by this constant of proportionality. Um, G and it's the universal constant of gravitation according to lots of experiments. Uh, you'll see it is uh, 6, 6 6.73 times 10 to the negative 12 meters cubed per kilogram second squared. Um, this works for any two bodies from the center of their body. We would use this for things like planets or satellite going around an object, and this would be the central force that always points towards the center of the other. So even at some position, maybe in its orbits changed and it's now over here, this force is still going to be pointed towards the center. And I'll go do a little special lecture on central force space mechanics also. All right, um, this works for any distance, and for any mass that we're concerned about. Um, it was proven that this doesn't work as the velocity approaches the speed of light. This doesn't work if we look at the quantum scale, but we're not looking at that stuff. So if we can model something as a, a particle or point mass, um, we can use these laws. All right, um, if we look at Earth and let M1 be some particle and M2 be the mass of Earth, so particle, we'll say ME, the 
particle is actually just negligible pretty much and we end up getting g equal to that constant times the mass of earth over r squared and you may have seen this before at the surface of earth we get g as 9.81 meters per second squared. All right, that's only at the surface of Earth, but we can go, if we're talking 10 meters or 100 meters, we can still use it. Interesting factoid, if you had a uh, deposit of minerals, oil, lead, something, heavy metal, you can take a pendulum and walk back, walk over land, and the period of the pendulum will change as you go over a heavier spot on land. And they used to prospect for oil and stuff like this back in the, back in the olden days because the period of a pendulum is only a function of gravity and a function of that length L. And we'll talk more about that. So we'll start saying that we can take this g and multiply it by mass and it's normally mg we'll call that an object's weight this is a force it would need direction right now we're just gonna say we can call it the weight um, if we used kilograms and for mass and uh, meters per second squared we get a kilogram meter per second squared or a Newton which is the units of force that we're going to be working in um, so if we have a mass and we need to calculate its weight we can do it just like this if we are working in um, feet pounds it's called the FPS system. If we're given an object in pounds, so they say an object weighs, it'll say weighs also, this is a key word, weighs X pounds. Well, pounds is not a mass. Pounds is a slug, or sorry, pounds is a weight. So if you're given the weight Usually this would be in a problem with feet in it, or pounds. Um, if you're given the weight in pounds, we can say that the mass is equal to that weight divided by the acceleration due to gravity. And that's going to be what we call a slug. In this acceleration we use for gravity here would be 32.2 feet per second squared. So it's all about being in a different unit system. If you see something in pounds, go ahead and you need to calculate the, with the mass typically. Um, all right, and since this is our first force, let's learn how to draw a free body diagram for it. This should be the first step for any problem that we have after listing our knowns or givens. Um, we're always going to represent the center of mass. And we can just say this is some M. We'll figure out how to find that center of mass later. Uh, I think you should probably also know. And we can draw an arrow down. We could have also just represented this body as a mass like this. And I don't usually label I don't usually label the weight as W. I'll label it mg. Mass times gravity. And we'll learn and I'll teach you that when I sum up the forces, whatever way the arrow is going, I'm gonna put the minus sign or the plus sign. And once again I do this for convention. Alright, um, thank you.